Magic and Life podcast. We have our host today, Pagogo, myself, Kevin, Sean, and our very our very special guest, uh, Bob the Builder. Because today <laughs> today we're gonna be talking about deck building. Yay! All right, um, I love this. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, though. So first off, uh, first big thing to talk about is the new meta. You know, ban came on Monday. Field of the Dead gone, like we predicted. Mistake. <laughs> not a mistake. So yeah, how's uh, mistake. how is uh, how is the ladder been? What what has the meta been looking like? Um, truth be told, haven't played too much uh ranked but mm. uh because i like to uh in these you know uh chaotic times so to speak like post bands and in, with new sets i i like to brew so i tend to just try out like wacky stuff or, or cards that i think are interested or maybe on the fringe that could potentially uh you know show some show some grit with the uh you know things shaking up a bit mm-hmm. um but I, I have noticed um, a lot of aggressive decks thriving right now because, you know, when the meta's a little fresh or whatever, people tend to trend towards those because it's just like, all right, well, I just go face and win the game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and control decks or mid-range decks may not have had the time to find the tools to, to deal with those decks. So I, I, I think in time we'll get a more, more of a balanced thing going on, but right now it seems like mostly like, you know, mono red, burn, mono red goblins, uh, you know, the new-ish uh, Azorius, like, you know, enchantments or whatever it is. Or is oh, God, yeah. Back. Yeah. And then you still see, like, some Rakdos sack in there with, like, the Citadel and everything, which is still obviously a great deck. And, and some other variants of Rakdos running around as well. Um, Kethis combo is still, like, hanging in the background, just like, you know. I have not seen that deck at all. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once you stop playing it, I mean. Yeah, once I stop playing it, it, you guys stop seeing it too. That's weird. Weird how that works. I mean, my my experience has been a little bit different in terms of, like, what I've been seeing on ladder. I've been seeing, I've seen my fair share of, like, Rakdos Pyromancer, which I've, I have tweaked the deck significantly, and I think, I think it's much stronger than what everyone else has right now but anyways we'll get to that later um in the past like day or two i've seen a, a huge uptick in uh Sultai control and i don't know if that's just because like i'm climbing higher on the ladder or people are just getting better um right. usually i usually i go to twitter and i look at what croakies tweets out because that, that he's usually pretty spot on about the meta and i don't know if he's spot on or if people are like Kroki said it's good, so I'm gonna just play that. Right. Shit. But um, he had he had a funny tweet the other day where it was just like, um, historic tier one meta decks right now is Uro plus fifty six cards, uh, Core Spirit Dancer plus fifty six cards, and Bolas the Citadel plus fifty six cards. And I'm like, yep, uh, he's not yeah. wrong. Like, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> they're they're all really strong. I I actually yeah. hadn't faced the the blue white aura deck until like the other day like for the first time it is miserable <laughs> yeah it's brutal it is I, I haven't played good. against it i haven't played against it since the ban but i had played against it beforehand i've played mm-hmm. against it before thought seasons in the format and you couldn't take away their core spirit dancer dude it was so, so it's, it's like it's brutal you're just like oh it's turn three and i'm taking 15 to the face yeah i mean i remember playing with the deck and, and just being like yeah, guys, I ha- it's turn four, and I have a fifteen nineteen on the battlefield. <laughs> so, like, excuse me? Did you did you just say what I think you said? Oh, yeah, I no. mean, like, so, like, the, the decks that I had mentioned, like, Salt Eye Control, or uh, uh, Blue-White Auras, and, like, Citadel-based decks, whether it's Jund or, like, Golgari, they've been good, but I don't feel like I don't have a chance against them. Yeah. Like, no, it's with, fine. I, I, today, this week has been so much fun. I'm just like, there's there's no Field of the Dead decks. <laughs> oh, mm-hmm. one deck I have been seeing a lot is Mono Green Ramp, because people are still yes. degenerates. Mm-hmm. Um, That's just always going to be a thing, just like Mono Red's always going to be a thing. Yeah, Mono Green, uh, it's not too bad. I mean, it mono can be... Mono Green Walkers or Mono Green, just like good stuff? Mono Green Ramp, just like into like Ulamog and Nissa and Ugin, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, I saw, I saw like a, like yeah, like a mono green Tron deck almost that seems mm-hmm. to be doing well. That's like, 
you know, shit ton of ramp, and then it runs Karn with a Karn sideboard. Yep. Uh, and both Ugins, three of each. Wow, that is. And then, and two Ulamog's main board, and it runs like, it just <laughs> ramps into these huge payoff cards. That's mega so, greedy. <laughs> It I, is I, mega greedy, but at the same time, they're still running, like, four elves, four elvish uh, visionary or whatever. They're probably running, like, so, I know some of them are running, like, Ley Line of Abundance. And then, mm -hmm. like, you just play Llanowar Elves, and you're like, oh, I have, like, four beta on turn, yeah. turn two. And I'm like, no, thank you. I want to make, make one of those. You, I think, Kevin, I think <laughs> that's the perfect mix of stuff. Well, I made Raptron. <laughs> I know. Well, I made, um, I made Mono Green Walker's deck. It was, like... It, it was four copies of Karn, so mm -hmm. the Karn witch board. Obviously. It was running like um, four Nissa, um, one Vivian, because I was also running like Crater Hoof in the sideboard that you could get with Vivian, and then just a bunch of just like, you know, Ugin, like Ugins, and then just a bunch of ramp stuff. Yeah, I mean, the deck seems fine to me. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, because you get, it's not like with Feel the Dead where you can just like, you, you're ramping and doing the same exact things, except you're also getting incremental value off of Feel of the Dead to kind of just like chump block everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to land a big threat and it needs to stay is the thing. So I think it's, I think it's totally fine. I think it's fine. Yeah. And like the, the versions that are running. Overpowered. What'd you say? Oh, so it's definitely not overpowered. Um, I will say the ones that are running like the ley line of of abundance versions like they're explosive that's for sure um hi baby um what you just caught me off guard Ooh, I hear you. um they're definitely like, like explosive but they're also very fragile in the sense that like if you if you just like shock their lantern worlds or like their mm -hmm. goose then it's like oh <laughs> I only, yeah. have, I only have two mana on turn two. Like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the deck has... It seemed fine. It seemed good. I don't know if it's, like, tier one. Maybe, like... No, one. I think it's probably top of tier two, maybe. But yeah, I, think, I can see that. I think, especially now, at least, you know, maybe this changes in the next couple of weeks, but just with the amount of aggro decks mm -hmm. kind of running around, I think that deck kind of just gets hit hard a lot of the time. Yeah, I agree. Any other decks that we've been seeing on ladder, or that have been popping up that people have not been liking? Not not something that people haven't been liking, but I don't know. Have you guys seen that um, that Rogue Legends list running around? Oh my god! Uh, sorry, god. Team of Legends. It's it's pretty insane. Yeah. Oh, who's who's the deck deck builder built it? Yeah, I was gonna say who's the deck builder yeah, on that? Uh, I don't know. It might be a. Uh... Some really Sorry. attractive uh, man. Sean Boyle, yeah. One thick yeah. boy made that deck. One, one, of the, one of the thickest boys made that. True. <laughs> well, tell us, about um, your, tell us about your deck, Sean. Let us hear about the Teamer Legends. Well, I, I could talk about that a little bit if when we get into the deck building portion. And I don't okay. really want to go like, too deep. Yeah. I mean, okay. the, last, the last deck, I guess, we can talk about... Mm -hmm is i guess we touched on it briefly but like the golgari Sack. citadel awesome. deck yeah yeah which i think is just busted <laughs> but i don't yep. know what you guys say like wh when you when you hear about the deck you're like it seems okay like yeah it seems strong but when you play with it you're like holy shit like you're yeah, doing exactly. unfair like, things I, I can do what right now like yeah like the you... first the first time i played against you with it i was like Okay, he landed Citadel, which is like obviously it's not good, but I'm like, okay, I think I should be okay, because you you were at like I don't know like twelve life or something, and the Literally Citadel, it's like you played, you went, you played everything went down <laughs> to like one or two life, and then just like had two or three blood artists and just sacked your whole board and hit right. me for like twenty five in the face with the, the Citadel thing, and I'm just like oh. The, cool. the, the card that like That's makes <laughs> the card that makes the deck so like good in my opinion is um Wo Strider. Yeah. I mean I mean blood no. Art blood artist yeah because like you you can ping and shit but no, um blood artist blood artist because you can't kill yourself. Well That's yes you, you ping and you gain life yes but like well the 
Wolfstrider is so instrumental because it, of course, it basically allows you to go infinite. Because if you, mm-hmm. if you brick a land on top or you brick a card that, uh, will cost you too much life, you just sack a creature, you scry that shit to the bottom, and you're like, hey look, I found the blood artist, or hey look, yep. I found another Wolfstrider, just some, some something, and sounds about right. I mean, you can you can land bulls to Citadel on turn like three if you really like wanted to. Probably really more, fight, yeah. Probably more consistently like four, four or five, obviously. Yeah, I think five. I think you get it by five, every almost time, every probably. time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the first time I played the deck myself, I told Pluto about it. Obviously. Um, literally played Citadel on turn four, ripped three blood artists off the top and just popped off. It was insane. You had so much I was, play, I was playing against goblins and I had the Citadel in hand and he didn't play a Muxus on turn four. I was like, okay, I win. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yep. It's yep. insane. Oh, I guess another deck that I, like, I feel like is under the radar and I haven't encountered it. I think I've only played against it like once, but I think that I feel like the deck has to be good. Is um, just like mono red aggro slash mono red burn. Um, I guess it'd be aggro. It's more of like the creature based version where you have like, um, you have yeah, like like second, you have like Earthshaker Kenras. You have like Soulscar Mages. You have Soulscar Mage. Hazards. Yep. Um, you run like Skewer. Gobl- and, Goblin uh, Chain Whirler is another one. Yep. Um, skewer the critics. Light up the stage. You know, like <laughs> strike shot. Yeah. All the good stuff. OG. Um, but yeah, like the, I feel like the deck is good. I don't, like, it might just be because like, no, no one wants to play, um, no. burn on arena or like aggro, but mm-hmm. I just haven't seen it. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, I've seen I mean, it. I, I haven't played enough, but like I know, like you, it, the deck's gotta be good right now. It just has to be. Yeah, mm-hmm. it exists. It takes advantage of, um, you know, a shaken up meta. You know, mm-hmm. praise on that type of situation. You know, another another yeah. deck that uh, I've I've been seeing played. I don't, I don't really know how good it is, um, but it's definitely better now. Is a uh, blue white control. That one's been uh, much better. Yeah, the I one... made a ban control list last night. Played against you. Oh yeah, that's right. Because so I need fun. to follow the I need to follow the construct of fifty six cards plus or fifty six cards and arrows. Yeah, four yeah, arrows. See, yeah, I made, six I made the mistake of building um, Jeskai control, which doesn't uh, have her uh, wrong colors. But... <laughs> but I do like it in the sense that I think it, it it lines up pretty well right now because it's it's hedges a little more towards um, a better game against these aggro decks, you know, because I can run like Lava Coil or Scorching Dragonfire or Anger the Gods. Yeah. Um, and then you know playing to late game with whatever win condition basically i want i guess mm-hmm. so it was uh blue white i mean honestly esper might be the best one because thoughtsies um but i i think they're gonna grow in popularity and in their efficiency which uh, is kind of exciting yeah i agree all right i think that's all for like the meta i mean it's still really early and yeah i think i think we covered most of it so let's uh so i, I kind of want this is why i brought bob on because you know he likes building decks <laughs> we like building decks well two of us like building decks so one of us like searching for decks um he's getting, be- he's getting better with it yeah um yeah, i'm getting more efficient with my searches but yeah i just want to talk about like deck building and just like how how we go about deck building how do we tweak decks I, that's the one thing i i, I really want to dive into is like how do we tune a deck because i feel like people talk about like this is how you build a deck all the time but like no one really talks about like how to tune it because right. most people because most people like they get a deck and they'll be like this deck's cool i'm playing this deck and then they never ever change it and the meta like, fucking yeah. evolves every week and i'm like uh right. you gotta sw- you gotta change this deck up man like mm-hmm. you this this version is very much out of date um yeah absolutely absolutely so like we'll start with kevin because i think 
what Kevin does is a good baseline for starting deck building. So Kevin, what do you, Fuji, can you stop sprinting around, man? I know you're so excited about deck building. He's having a good time, bro. But we just gotta bring it down, okay? Thank you. Um, yeah, so, I mean, what I do is, you know, I'll just go on, there's a bunch of different sites. Like, I think it's like MTGA Zone, MTG Goldfish, like, you know, sites that just have, like, even just, not even just, like, metagame trackers, but, like, just deck lists, mm -hmm. like, from top, top place, you know, whether it be tournaments or just, like, whoever's top on the ladder. So, so I'll look, I'll look at a few sites and kind of, like, look for, you know, people that are top, like, 500 mythic or something because you know they play the deck consistently you know they're kind of they've taken the time to tune things to kind of find out what's good and what's not mm -hmm. um and, and sorry to interrupt you know they're a good player right yeah and you know they're better than you <laughs> yeah. um so i'll do that or i'll look at like mtg goldfish is good for this if you kind of look at recent events you can look at you know was it like Hoogalandia's open stuff like that? Like there's like weekly people host weekly tournaments and stuff like that. Like even that, or just, you know, random tournaments that are a few around just to kind of get a good idea. It's like, what's top aided, you know, you're seeing kind of the same decks consistently among the top eights. Like obviously back when team or rec was all the rage, like you would look at, you know, top eights and there'd be three or four copies of team or rec consistently across, you know, different tournaments you know the deck is good no matter what the me like the metagame is in that certain tournament so I look for stuff like that and then you know once i find you know a style of deck i want to build so like if i'm looking for an aggro deck or if i'm looking for mid-range ramp control whatever i'll i'll take a look at a few different versions a few different kind of styles so like look at you know band control salt eye control kind of figure out what fits my preferences more in terms mm -hmm. of just like what I like to play. And then I'll look at a couple different lists and kind of pick which one I think makes more sense given what I've been playing against or what I see. Mm -hmm. And then and then I'll play the deck, play a few, you know, play some games with it. And then, you know, after you know, you play a few best of threes, you kind of realize like, okay, this card's not doesn't really make sense for the metagame I'm going up against, or like maybe, you know, typically what I'll do first before I move anything out of the main deck is I'll look at the sideboard. Right. you know make a couple of tweaks you know a lot of the, i've been playing a lot of karn decks recently between mono green ramp right now and field of the dead rest mm -hmm. in peace um before yes. ah. and i was running the i was running band field of the dead with karn and karn sideboards so, so a lot of times karn sideboards is obviously like the whole point of running it is to you know get what's best for every situation right when you mm -hmm. resolve a card you can activate it so a lot of the time, you know, obviously auto include is Graph Digger's Cage. Do I need two of them? Like in my mono green ramp deck right now, I'm running two Graph Digger's Cages oh. and go go blow up both of them in the last game we played. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, you, you run things like, you know, you're seeing a lot of Rakdos decks, which is the case now. So it's like, okay, Chroma's Memorial is pretty good. Um, are you running into a lot of blue eye control? Um the Immortal Sun might be pretty good because, like, yeah, it shuts you off your Karn, but, you know, if you resolve an Immortal Sun against an Azorius Control deck whose only real win con is either Shark Typhoon Planes or Walkers. Planeswalkers, it's pretty good. So, you know, it's it's pretty good. You know, my, you know, I, I just, I've just never been a deck builder. I, I don't know why. It's probably because I played, Sean taught me how to play. And, you know, Sean <laughs> just gave me, no, no, don't mean like that, but, like, when I first started playing and I was playing like standard and like modern with you guys in the garage, like you just give me a deck and I'd be like, Oh, this deck's pretty good. <laughs> and then I just play it. So <laughs> I never like had to think that's about very, it. That's very, that's very true. Yeah. I'll never forget when Sean gave me a, de a pink, a uh, deck with pink sleeves and it was in fact. And I was like, Oh, this is really fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Dude, you didn't even play when there was like scale up. Did you? Well, I played I played Infected Modern when it had scale up. Oh, well, when it had scale up, uh, yeah, dude, that shit yeah. was great. Yeah, it was just like turn two. It's like turn <laughs> one, 
Turn two, scale up, mutagenic growth, mutagenic growth, you're dead. <laughs> you're like, did you have fun? I learned a lot that game. Yeah, that um, was insane. Uh, so that's, that's typically what I do. I know, like, people, you know, some there's a lot of, like, stigma against, like, net decking, which, like, I get. Like, there's not there's not that much creativity involved. But, like, you know, I think if you're, if you're net decking and you're, like, looking up good decks, it's like, yeah, it's a good base. But, like, you still, you know, if you're getting, you know, butt slammed by burn every game and like your sideboard that you have doesn't have any tools to help against burn like mm -hmm. you should be you know you should change and, and like and we're 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 like we're semi-competitive competitive players right so like yes we could maybe start from complete scratch and play with whatever we want and then kind of tune it from there but eventually we're going to get to a point where we're going to be like similar to a list that's already like refined so why why like i don't want to take the time to refine a list over a week only to mm. arrive at the same conclusion that some other people have come came yeah, at exactly. i'd rather that's another thing. like I i'd rather start where they're at and then tune it from there because i don't yeah. i don't want to have to to do all that shit yeah and that's another thing for me it's just like the time like i'd rather yeah. spend the time playing than like brewing a deck just for me because like i don't have it's not me at all <laughs> see I, the yeah. part the part <laughs> i the part that i enjoy the most is like tweaking the deck like just sliding out cards here and there whether it's main board sideboard and then like seeing how the deck plays me like oh my god this is this is so much better than like what i was doing and like yeah i'll bring up the deck that i've been i've been working on this this past week but um but yeah sean uh how do you go about deck building Team or legend. I listen. I start with a search for teamer cards, and I just go from there. No, um, he so, he filters his collection to teamer cards. And teamer, <laughs> blue, red, green. So truth be told, like um, typically, so like when we first started playing historic, you know, we were playing for a few. I was only playing for a few weeks, I guess, with you guys before, mm -hmm. like I'm and Ket remastered came in and stuff like that. Um, which obviously shook things up a bunch, but like when Amiket Remastered come out came in, like, and I have a little more of a history than you guys with like Magic, um, but when a set like that comes out and I see the cards that are going to be put in it, um, usually I, I look at like the strongest cards in the format, right? Like, that's usually where I start, and then I branch off from there with like, okay, what well, color supplements this card the best? What well, color supplements this card the best? I personally don't like to run monocolor decks; I hate it um so I'd, I'd rather run two or three colors um mm -hmm. but I, I tend to look at the strongest cards and then build something from there based on you know obviously like cast archetypes um and then there's also just you know what card synergize really well with it uh so i like to usually get like a theme or an archetype built in my head mm -hmm. with at least three or four colors that it could potentially flex into if, and this is talking like if I'm going like from scratch and then, you know, I'll put in those key cards and then go from there. So if like, I'm like, okay, thoughts is a great card. Wrath of God is a great card. Where do I go from here? Probably building an Esper deck, right? Um, but eventually what happens is I see it, how a meta develops. And then what I like to do is like, just play a deck that's, that doesn't exist basically in the format, like the Rug Legends list, for example, right? Obviously not a competitive list. I mean, I win. I win a lot of games with it. I was gonna say, do you play that deck on ladder? I do. I do actually. Um, <laughs> and it's usually like best of ones when I when I do play a deck like that. Uh, yeah. Because the sideboard one, the sideboard's atrocious. <laughs> and uh, okay. And and I play against you guys a lot, but it can do like explosive things. Like I can go like turn two Kinnon into Mox Amber into Dorel. And then it's just like, okay, go from there. Um, so, so it's fun. Um, but in circumstances like that, you really want to look at like, is this deck capable of beating, you know, the monster decks in the format right now, right? Yeah. Like, can I beat mono red with that deck? Do I have any like to stand on? So I'm like, all right, you know what helps against mono red, you know, some spot removal and Uro. So it's like, okay, great. Well, I'm in blue green already. So <laughs> Uro's obviously going in. And he's yeah. a legend. You fulfilled the requirement. Right. I fulfilled the requirement. Um, 
So you have to go like, I can it beat those decks? If it can't beat those decks and you don't care and you're just playing casually, fine. But if it can't beat those decks and you're actually looking to like build something that like can at least win 50% of your games, mm -hmm. um, then, then you have to change it, right? So like you start with like, oh, this is a cool fun list. Like I like to run cards that like no one else is running or cards that are like pet cards to me. Uh, like Genesis Ultimatum, right? Like love that card. How good is it really? Um, and then kind of go from there and then I'll be like, all right, fine. I can't run Throne or whatever. So like, <laughs> um, I guess I'll take it on my main board. Like, and <laughs> you sacrifice from there. Uh, but that's the part that gets me interested in first. It's like, oh, these are cool cards. Yeah. And they're, they're still good cards. Mm -hmm. So can I build something from here? And then eventually it'll evolve into like, some sort of like, you know, niche outskirts deck that, you know, can steal some games or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. And like, like Kevin was saying, like, you know, I like to put the time into that. I'd rather play. For me, I'd rather put like an hour of time into like tweaking or building this deck, test it a bit, and then go back and be like, okay, take out this, take out this, put two of these in. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what Pagogo was saying, where like he enjoys that like give and take. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, like just like trying to maximize the deck, like maximize your win percentage. Right, and that's fun. And like when you figure out a new thing, like oh man, this card's like I didn't even think of this card before, but it like it hits this spot exactly where I need it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like such a cool feeling. And uh, um, another another great feeling is like you're playing a deck, and like there's a card that's just ran in it. Like everyone just fucking runs it, but you like you just kind of sit there and you're like. Is this card bad? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, you're, right. you're like, should I take Thoughtseize out of my deck? <laughs> what? Well, yeah, it's, <laughs> come on now. No, but like, uh, like I've been running like the Rakdos Pyromancer deck, and like everyone's running Luris in it. They're like, yep, run Luris, just include it. It's easy. And I, like, I played with it. And I'm just like, it doesn't seem that great to me. Like. Yes, Luris is good. I don't deny that. But it doesn't seem as strong as, like, I would want it to be. And, like, I was like, well, what could I include that, like, Lur like you can't have in the deck otherwise because of Luris? So stuff that costs, or permanents that cost three, four, five mana. So I, 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 like, started looking, and I was like, you know, if I'm, if I'm milling myself a lot already... What if I looked at like, uh, like Ox of Agonis? Because like, I have like four Stitcher Supplier. I, ha I had four uh, Meyer Triton. Yeah, that's what it's called, right? Yeah. Um, so I had that and I was like, oh, yeah, like Ox seems really good, Ox of Agonis, because I can just pay two mana and get it back and draw three cards essentially. And I, I kind of equated it to like uh, Bedlam Reveler from Modern because it, it's, it's the same effect. Um, it's just perhaps maybe a little bit harder to to play it just because you have to exile the cards in your graveyard and you're already like exiling a lot of cards from your graveyard but um yeah i was like oh ox seems really cool so i started playing ox and then i'm like i think i need like better mill in this deck and i was just like i don't really like mire triton that much so let's let's fuck the mire triton and what else mills and i'm like ashiok i'm like boom four of Ashiok slaps in that deck, um, but yeah, that, that like that that was like one of the situations where I'm just like, is Luris a bait? And so then I just kind of tweak right. the deck to to fit Ox more, and like right. th the deck has been <laughs> it's been pretty fucking good. Like Kevin's played against it a couple times, and like it and that's slaps. Like, that's the other yeah. thing that's exciting too about brewing, which like. I don't know, maybe Kevin, like, because you haven't been brewing much, like, you haven't, like, come across this, but, like, when you make a deck that's your own, and you can, like, win pretty consistent with it, it feels so good. I hate, I really do hate, like, copying a deck list, like, mm -hmm. card for card. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll look at a couple of deck lists that are, like, doing really well, right? Like, so, for example, a week ago, we had uh, the Field of the Dead decks running around. And we had like, oh, here's a Sultai list, and here's a Bant list or whatever. I kind of look at both of them. And I'm like, all right, like I'm not smashing these two decks together because obviously it would be a disaster. Um, but like, you know, how are how is each deck hedging against each other? 
you know, is one Masker Worm enough in the main board with all these field decks right now? Do I want to run two or three maybe in the main? Um, is that too much? What matches does that make it bad against? And you could just tweak your decks. Like Kevin's saying, like, you know, after you play the deck a bit, like, he'll tweak it, right? I'll change a couple sideboard cards. Maybe I'll take something out of the main board, put something new in. Some people don't do that. So, like, they'll just, like, like Pagot was saying, they'll just take this stock 75 and play, like, for three weeks with it and then be like, what does my win rate suck? And it's like, because, like, for your example, like, you're playing mono red 30% of the time, so you just auto-lose all of those games. Yeah, um, yeah. So, like, I think it's important to keep that open mindset of, like, what to switch out. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, like, just winning with your own deck is just... Yeah, there's the there, there's two things that I, I like I don't like about using someone else's list like without like tweaking it is one it just like you said it feels so good to like win with your own deck and part of it also is like there are times where like you'll play with someone else's deck and you'll win and you'll be like did I win because I was a good player or did I just win because like it was the, the deck was. like it was their deck and if at least it, at least if you build the deck and you win you're like I don't know if I played well but I'd made that deck. So I, <laughs> right. I'm a deck builder. Like, at least yeah. I know that's that's one went well. Yeah. Um, and then exactly. the the other thing is like, when you play in tournaments, I hate running stock lists. I I never run a stock list in a tournament because everyone knows what's in the list. Like, if you're in a competitive tournament, they know what it, you're running, and mm -hmm. I I I try to use that against them. Where like, if a certain card is run and I feel like I can get away with it, maybe run some sort of secret tech then I'm going to do that because I don't want people knowing my list card for card. I want Absolutely. to be able to, I want I want to be able to have some sort of surprise factor against them. Yeah. No, that's actually a really good point. Like and I feel like with like if you're a good brewer you can win games just off that. Like I I've literally had people on ladder concede to me when I went Kinnon into Mox Amber my thinking because they either thought I was playing Rug Song or Kethis Combo, because they both run that. Yep. And they were like, fuck this, my matchup sucks, like, fuck. And they just concede. Meanwhile, like, my deck runs fucking Sarkhan and Kamal's <laughs> <laughs> And I'm just like, okay, bro. Like, and, and then you go into game two, and you all of a sudden, like, turn one, they go, like, Graph Digger's Cage, you're like, cool, buddy. Like, oh, I don't I don't yeah. give a shit. Can't play Uro, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, that that factor is huge and like mm -hmm. you can literally like steal a game like when i played in standard like my most probably competitive i was playing like uh john monsters hmm. at a time around like you know um when like blue grunos was in and i think like around theros or a little after um the original theros but um i remember playing against this control player uh like kevin jones and he was like you know, we're in, like, game three or whatever, and I played Miscutter Hydra, great sideboard card. Can't be counted pro blue. Best card against his Warriors control, right? Seems good. With with haste, and it's X and green. Like, it's a Hydra. So you're just like, bam, you're already ramping. You're like, okay, here's a 5-5 five five with haste that's pro blue. Can't be counted. Can't yeah. Be yeah. So he's like, okay, cool. He has, like, I, I hold two mana open. He goes, he just, like, slam down a fucking Wrath of God. There's nothing you can do against this card. I was teching in at the time Volvari Charm, which, like, one of its modes is... Um, give your creatures indestructible ton a turn. And at the time, like, no one was really playing that card. And he just, like, looked at me and he was like, okay. He's like, alright, we got <laughs> Like, that's it. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure he conceded on the spot. And I was just like, alright. Yep. Um, it's like those cards that, like, have powerful effects, because, like, the other modes, the other one of the other modes was good. It was, like, destroying enchantment. So, like, it's good, you know, for, like, these sideboard cards that people bring in. Uh, but anyway, that surprise element, whether it's coming out of your sideboard where you have a few copies on your main board, um, is something that, like, you absolutely you can steal games with. Mm -hmm. And um, makes you feel like, oh, I'm so smart. Look what I did. Whether it's true <laughs> or not, it's a different story, obviously. But uh, it's always a feel good to, like, have that in there. And then if your choice in playing that card be, like, rewarded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, so. this, this past week, like I said, I've been I've been working on my. I don't know what to call it. It's a Rakdos deck. I don't know if I should call it like Rakdos Ox or like Rakdos Dredge or like Rakdos Self Mill. I don't know. It's it's some Rakdos deck, 
that mills yourself. But um, yeah, like when when I was like building the deck this week, or just like tweaking tweaking it, because I mean it it changed drastically. I mean it went from like the stock like Rakdos Pyromancer list to I'm running like Necrotic Wound, Ashiok, three Ox of Agonises, uh, two of Braids main board, and like um, what else am I? I mean, an important like thing to note. Sorry to like disrupt yeah, your go ahead, go ahead. even more after you just forgot something. Is that like your deck changed drastically? But like Ashok's just like good in our meta right now. Like people don't realize like just in your main board, like being able to exile a graveyard in this meta, it's is, super like, strong. Game changer. Like if you never have to worry about playing against an Uro in that deck, which is like one of the cards that's like sometimes hard for you to deal with. Like okay. So See, now my win percentage goes up this much because I never, literally never, have to worry about someone resolving like an unchanged hero. Two two funny moments I had with Ashiok this week was I had Ashiok on turn three and I mill myself. My opponent plays Fabled Passage when he has four lands and he cracks it and he didn't find a basic land and in my head I'm like, oh he's holding them all and then he says, oops and I'm like, oh Ashiok doesn't let you search decks. So he just yeah. like right. he just played the land and cracked it. It's like yeah. he just like wasted himself. Yeah. Um, and and like, then that's the thing. It's like go ahead. And then I was gonna say like the other moment was like I I was facing like the Rakdos Pyromancer mirrors, and like they'd go like there was a turn where the guy went like Stitcher Supplier Stitcher Supplier, and then I think like a like a young Pyromancer, and I just slam Ashiok, mill myself, exile his graveyard. I got rid of like. A Kroxa and Arcanist and like a claim to fame, and I was just like, "Yeah, Sweet. that's good." Don't have to worry about those cards anymore. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, in this meta, it's it's very strong. Huh? Yeah. So you know, making those choices once again, like you see the effect it has and the impact it has after you tweak your deck a bit, and you realize like, okay, and then from there, like I'm already thinking like in my head, I'm like, okay, now like, maybe I should make an expert control deck and put like two or three dash outs in the main, you know? Like you just like. <laughs> You realize that it there are implications for that card outside of like what you're using it in even. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that that was that was another thing. I, I like as I was making my deck, I was like, I was I was playing. And I was like, you know, something just feels off about village rights. Like in my mind, I'm like, this is a good card, like on paper and in theory, it's just a, it's, a, it's a strong card. But I'm like, it's just not working in my deck because like. I already had card draw with Ox of Agonis. Like, that's my card draw. So I was just like, I don't need this card. So I just, I, I took out all three copies that I was running and I put in, like, another Necrotic Wound, which is incredible in that deck. And then I started to mainboard two of Braids because I started realizing, like, a lot of people have Graft Digger's Cage, like, either mainboard or they have, like, a way to access it through, like, Karn. Karn. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I was just like, and also a bridge is good against like bulls to citadel. So I'm like, I'll just run two copies. And like, another like re like reason why it's nice having main board is like, if you need to like flash, if you need to cast it, even though you milled it, you have a way to go like, Dreadhard Arcanist, use the fame part of claim to fame, give it plus two attack, and then attack, and now you can abrade with it. Obviously, it it doesn't work with Graph Digger's Cage because you can't cast from the graveyard, but still, mm -hmm. it's like it's still like really strong so well, like that added like that added little synergy that like increases your percentage of doing something mm -hmm. uh, no matter how slight like you're running the cards anyway right so like having that built-in you know combination is just nice you know it's just an added bonus mm -hmm. yeah so like i i started mainboarding those two abrays and like my win percentage just like went up really high because of that mm -hmm. like I, I won so many games just because I had main board a braid and I was like, oh. Reward, yeah. Rewarded for deck rewarded, building boys. Right. And like the the other like part of that is like, okay, like we were just talking about, there's so many aggro decks in the format right now. Two of braids in the main is just fine, right? Like mm -hmm. are you playing against Azorius or Orius <clears> and they try to put in all that glitters on their spirit dancer, you're just like, oh I'll just braid in response. You just yep. like two for one them mm -hmm. and now they're way behind on tempo, which they, they need. So so and fine. You just take 
you just take the game from there. Good against red still, good against gruel. Like. Yeah, it's also fine against like the uh, mono green like Karn decks because like mm-hmm. they grab whatever artifact they want. And you're just like, all right, I'll just blow it up. <laughs> yeah, cool. Go ahead, play it. Yeah. But yeah, so like my my list is much different now. I like, I I even like. I sorry, I have like four tiny bones in the sideboard. Like at first, I had Stormfist Crusaders because I was like, I want some sort of like card draw or like way to like pressure the opponent. But I was like, I don't like that they draw cards in this format. Like in standard, I think Stormfist is more viable just because like the cards you draw are not as strong as you do in historic. So like, I just didn't want my opponents drawing like strong cards. So I was like, wow, what what draws me like cards, but like doesn't let like doesn't do what Stormfist does. And I was like, well I guess Tiny Bones draws me cards. Like I have four Thoughtseize in the main. I have four Dreadhorde, Dreadhorde Arcanist that can flashback Thoughtseize. I run three Croxes and those can get flashback or they can uh, escape. Mm-hmm. So I'm like Or just attack every turn. Yeah, I'm like <laughs> I'm like at worst Tiny Bones is just like a one two that like mm-hmm. sometimes draws me a card, but then also like because I discard like their hands so much, if they have no hand like pay six, they lose ten life. Yeah, I'll just, take that. I just win the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's cool, and and that whole like process is, it's very fun. It's just very fun to me. Yeah. It's one of my favorite parts about the game. Um, so we got to get Kevin to do it. Yes, we have to inspire Kevin. Um, Kev, I'm sending you. I'm sending you a list right now, by the way, to look at. But that's besides the point. Um, yeah. So. <clears throat> The Rogue Legends list is still, like, I have to tweet the shit out of it still. But, like, I just slapped in a bunch of, um, some Kinnon, some Mox Opals, a bunch of Planeswalkers. Where I have, like, Narset, Big Chandra, Nyssa. Mm-hmm. Nyssa's huge in that deck. I think I have three. I got Teferi. <laughs> Kevin, were you yawning or making a face at Sean? <laughs> oh, yawning. <laughs> wow. I just see him go like this. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Uh oh, <laughs> okay. and we're back. Um, yeah. So like, Kevin, I know you don't deck build as much, but like, do you see like anything that like any mistakes that deck builders like commonly make when making their decks? Uh, besides building team or legends, um, I don't know. I mean. It depends, right? Like, if people put to, you know, it's the only thing that, like, I don't have, like, a specific example, but, like, people taking kind of, like, a stock list, right? And, you know, like, not like you are you're, you were doing with your Rakdos deck where you're kind of, like, shifting the strategy a little bit. Mm-hmm. But, like, taking out, like, four cards and just putting in, like, some kind of pet card you have yep. that you're, like, obsessed with. Yep. And it's, like okay, you put a pet card in, but if your deck is four cards worse than it was before, um, yeah, I feel like it's not really worth it. So, like, that's that's the only thing I can think of. I don't know, like, any specific examples. But, like, people sometimes, you know, have cards that they just are obsessed with. And, you know, yeah, yeah even that... if it's just, like, you know... They want to play have, that card. You, even if it's just, like, you're obsessed with Yorian, for example, but like your deck doesn't really need a Yorian as its companion or something. But you're just like, I I love flicker effects or for whatever reason because you're a fucking weirdo. Um, <laughs> I like flicker effects. I like flicker effects. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just like putting you no, know, but like putting in a Yorian for like a deck. Say if you have like an Azorius control deck and it's very streamlined and you. Like you're like, oh, I want to play Urian. So now you have an eighty card deck, and it's just like, okay, what do you slot in? You know? Yeah, I don't know. That's the only thing I can think of. Just like pet cards and being, no, putting, I... putting too much value on, on pet cards over like cards that are critical to your to your deck. Yeah, I, I definitely see that a lot too. Where people like will see a card and be like that card seems good. Like we should add that to the deck. But like in practice, it like it kind of goes against like your strategy or it doesn't it just doesn't mm-hmm. play out that well. Like. A good example I have is, like, Kethis combo. Um, I was, like, trying to look for, like, sideboard cards that kind of, like, got rid of, um, like, artifacts. And I got to the point where I was siding in too many creatures that were not legendary. So then when I started playing the deck, I was like, 
I can't use Kethis's ability because they're not legendary. Like, I can't exile them mm-hmm. from the graveyard. So I'm just like, oh, I need to, like, tone this back a bit because, like, I'm right. just... I'm making the deck significantly <clears throat> worse than, like, what it is. But, yeah, right. I, I definitely say that a lot where people see, like, some cool card and then they're like, oh, add it in this deck. And it's just like, that doesn't yeah. belong in that deck. And you can't always do that, right? And it's even more applicable today, I feel like, because, like, there are some cards where people can, like, they've been reprinting some cards into, like, even, like, standard and stuff. And especially with the store, because, like, anthologies, they just rat, add random shit all the time. But, like, I'm thinking about, like, Azusa. Azusa is like fits my preferences very yeah. well. Like I love green ramp decks, but like in historic, when you have growth spiral and explore and Uro and all this stuff, like there's really no slot for Azusa when all those other things do things more efficiently. Cause like growth spiral, yeah, you might not have a land in hand, but you draw a card, get a land, you can play it as opposed to like Azusa, mm-hmm. play her. If you don't have extra lands, then it's just like, a dead card basically because it's not like a good body or anything so it's like i love azusa but i'm not going to put it in a deck you know yeah another good example of that is a uh, when gary came to standard um people were really hyped about it and like people people right. i mean a lot of people played mono black decks but after like yeah. two weeks you just you didn't see them anymore like it it just it wasn't as strong as what it was in the when it first came out which yeah. is not not because like Gary didn't change. I mean, it's still the same card. It's just that the card surrounding Gary changed, and therefore, yeah. it didn't make him as great of a card. Like I, I, I can't remember like what the exact cards were, but I remember the argument was like you had much better card draw for mono black back then. You had like much better like hand disruption for black as well. So like all that together with Gary was very oppressive. Whereas like when it when he when he just came out, it was like you don't really have hand disruption. You don't really have good card draw for black. So now you're just banking on landing these creatures and they just, like, stick. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, like, yeah, it says a lot. It says a lot about what a meta is, right? And, mm-hmm. like, how you have to adapt deck building to a meta. And it's not always just, like, this card's powerful, um, which some people fall into the trap of. It's definitely a trap. Because huh? mm-hmm. even, like... <clears throat> Was it like even Zach was saying like, oh my god, Gary is like gonna be insane in these like black X decks, you know? Mm-hmm. And like I haven't seen a copy of Gary in like three weeks. Um so you know, it just goes to show that cards just because they're powerful in one format, not necessarily gonna be the case. Yeah. And you know, beyond that, maybe just like mono black's just not good enough right now. So it just doesn't warn a slot. Mm-hmm. Um It <laughs> It was funny that there's a uh what the fuck? My mouse is acting up right now. Sorry. There was a funny tweet I saw from Crokey's today. Or was it today? It was t- today or yesterday. But he says, <laughs> I'm never playing Collected Company again. Yesterday I had three Cocos in a row completely brick. At 2.7% 2. 7, 2. 7 of pop to brick. I don't even know how to do the math. Based completely on my obscenely unlucky run with it and ignoring the math, I have deduced that this card is a scam. <laughs> mm-hmm. I found that very, that's, I found that very funny. It feels bad when you whiff on Coco. Mm-hmm. That's another thing. Like, I feel like that's kind of hard about deck building sometimes too. Is like, you have to look at like the math of like some cards, like Coco yeah. example for an example. Like, Absolutely. <clears throat> like in practice, Coco is it's a it's a good card. We all know it's a good card, but like, you may experience like three games in a row like let's say you just added it to a deck and you're like i'm gonna play three games and see how coco feels and then all of a sudden like you just whiff each time or you only hit like one creature and you're like this card sucks it's not that great but like is it you know variance right there is it just testing or is it like you know it, it is actually bad so like you sometimes you just have to like look at like uh like the math behind the card or like the, the um, sometimes people talk about like the floor and the ceiling for the card um right which yeah. i i don't or think the, a lot the, what's it go ahead i was gonna say which i don't think a lot of people like think about yeah and it's a mistake that i mean even like you were just saying right like i diluted the number of legends in my deck to the extent that like this just doesn't work anymore mm-hmm. like there's a number in there where like here's the <clears> optimal <throat> number or here's the minimum number 
and then like here's a top number without me just like losing my the game because i have no other things but legendaries in my deck you know yeah um and that's that's an easy example um or like you know finding a balance between like in a control deck definitely finding a balance between like permission and like removal you know or permission spot removal and sweepers Mm -hmm. um and that's all always going to be based on the meta and then also like you can't just play like 30 counter spells in your deck like how are you winning you know obviously yeah. on like the the most drastic side of things mm -hmm. um yeah going like going more into like the numbers like <laughs> how many times have you guys actually like done the math for your mana base but like a good amount actually ha ha okay yeah, so I'm, and i don't even build decks well, I think like okay, think so okay, so what I'm I so this article that I read a couple of years ago, I I always reference when I'm like making my own deck. If if it's like a pre like pre made deck, like I find it online, I just kind of trust the mana base. Um, very rarely do I tweak it, but like there's a there's an article by a man named Frank Karsten, if you know who he is, and the article it uh it's up up on stream right now for those who want to see, and I'm gonna put it in the link of um the the youtube video but it's an article saying how many colored mana sources do you need to consistently cast your spells a guilds of ravnica update so basically he um in the article it kind of talks about like how how like consistently do you want to like cast a a card on a certain turn um and how many like colored uh sources do you need for that and i know it's right. kind of hard to see on the screen right now but like if you look at it like it shows like if you want to play like a card that has only one color and it costs one mana, it's like Lantern Worlds, for example. If you want to cast that consistently on turn uh, one, you need at least 14 green sources because that provides mm -hmm. you a 91% chance, 91.4% chance of playing that card. And then it's like, okay, well, what if I want to cast um, like an Elvish Arch Druid on turn? Normally you play that on like turn, you know two or three but like yeah. let's say three so you look on the, the little thing right here he has up and this is based on like a 60 card deck you need at least 18 green sources to play elvish archer it's just like oh, okay that's mm -hmm. that's how many i need and like it's very helpful because at, at certain points you realize like um oh i need x amount of sources for this card and i also need x amount of lands to be able to like even cast my spells on curve because i see that happen a lot too where people will like they'll make a deck and they'll be like it's a 21 land deck and i have four or five drops and you're like Ooh, you're yeah. you ain't casting that shit boy Good like, luck. Yeah. like it, that's rough like unless yeah. like and obviously there are other factors that goes into like your right. mana base like how you're much card like draw million, yeah how much running a million cantrips or something. like mana dorks you have so like in this article he also covers that like how like how to count like mana dorks and like fetch lands and like tap lands because like he he like like a basic forest counts as like a land right but how do you mm -hmm. count like a temple of mystery because it's a tap land it, it, it's like do you count that as like a land or do you count that as like a half land and so like you take mm -hmm. that into account for your math and even like your card draw too like your card draw on some level counts as like um Ma not mana but like it, it digs mana you for fixing. your it digs you for your mana so like i think right here like he said like a cheap scry effect uh, like a cheap scry one effect is approximately like 0.2 black sources mm -hmm. or like in this example he has here so like let's say you had five like scry effects then that equals like one land essentially land. Right, right so yeah th this article has been very helpful it was it was extremely helpful for like um when I was making, like, Kethis combo, because that's a four-color deck. So, like, you need to be able to, like, figure out, okay, how many green sources do I need? How many black sources do I need? How many blue sources do I need? How many white sources do I need? And that can be very daunting, right? Yeah, and obviously, in a four-color deck, absolutely. Yeah. And obviously, you don't need to follow that guide, like, like word for word. Like, maybe you don't want to cast X card on on like turn three at a 90 percent rate maybe you, you're okay mm -hmm. with like an 85 percent rate right yeah. so you, like you can just go with that but like at least you know the math is there right yeah, um, it exists and like that gives you something like hedge off of too right like 
Mm -hmm. you can you can take a hit here in order to more consistently do something else yeah um yeah no that's it's very true and like people don't think about that and even outside of like your land base like i mean you could do that with everything right like do i really need to run four copies of this card especially if it's like a legendary you know mm -hmm. um or three just enough like how often do i want to be casting this card um what are my chances that i draw my wrath of god on turn four you know um so i have like scry lands helping me do that i have opt helping me do that i have whatever else um mm -hmm. and uh is that going to be good enough and in this meta do i need it on turn four every game mm -hmm. so there there's a lot that that goes into it and usually you get a feel for most of that stuff just like play testing the deck right like if you're like oh, i'm playing my three color deck and like geez I, I just seem to never be able to hit double red on turn three like okay you should probably you should probably fix that <laughs> Mm -hmm. Also, so, yeah. you know, another thing that I think is like really important to deck building is just like having friends to help you build it. Like you don't have right. to just do it by yourself. Like of course. Yeah. it's like that's why I love playing with like the both of you. Not only because like I get to play against other other decks, mm -hmm. but like you guys help me realize like, hey, this shit ain't working for your deck, or like this mm -hmm. this keeps happening a lot. Like right. it's it's nice to have like more sets of eyes and try to like notice patterns with your deck whether it's like this seems good this seems bad you're not hitting lands mm -hmm. you're hitting too many lands it's like mm -hmm. oh i didn't think of it like that so like i think it's it's very nice to have like uh, a group of friends that can help you deck build with you right absolutely and like yeah and or just like tell you not to run a deck right like mm -hmm. kevin just shitting on you know team Air legends and stuff like that i only i only shit on it because i haven't beat it yet you haven't beat his deck yet? That's I, only play, I only played against it once, to be fair. Like once or twice, yeah. So you have a 100% loss rate. And I have a 100% win rate. Oh my okay. god. Always True. against Kevin. Um, and I, and I, the deck, I, I did play Field of the Dead against him. So. That's true. You were watching that game, I think, for Gogo. <laughs> how did, wait, how did you lose that? Uh, hello? Kamal's yeah. druidic whatever on like for ten on turn God tier deck, and I was just mm -hmm. you had like five planeswalkers out at the same time. Something so, like but you have like five hundred zombies. I don't. Know. What happened? Easy win. Oh, was it? Resolved, like, oh, was it just like you? Or oh, I was gonna say, did was it just like you had a lot of planeswalkers and then you played like Sarkin and swung overhead or something like that? Yeah, oh. that's one hundred percent probably how I won. I win most gotcha. of my games like that. <laughs> Oh, that's great. God. And then, like, I love when people, like, forget about Sarkhan's static ability with the dragon. There's so many... Because well, the, the fucking Planeswalkers... Wait, what is static ability? The static ability is, like, whenever a creature attacks you or Planeswalker you control, or it might just be a Planeswalker you control, uh, it get it gets dealt one damage. Uh, well, damage equal to the number of dragons you control. So, yeah. like, if he makes a drag a couple of dragons and you attack me with your zombies, they all get machine gunned down. <laughs> Uh, it was just like it's just hilarious, and then people are like, "Oh shit, I forgot that was an ability." Yeah, I had no idea. I didn't have a static ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it, it's it's usually not so bad because usually like he only most of the time he produces only like one dragon one. token. Yeah, so like yeah, yeah. when you attack, he, your your creature is only taking one. So it's like sometimes you're just like, "Oh shit, good thing, good thing there's only one dragon." But there mm. are, like I, there are times where I've been seeing like Sean play, and he has like three dragon tokens out, and I see yeah. like I see the opponent go to like combat step, and I'm like. Oh, does he know? <laughs> and he's like, does he know? Does swing he all out. Like, yep, I just see him like swing all out, and I'm like, oh no, the bad things are about to happen. <laughs> that, that's another reason why I love playing like cards that people don't play against no. that often. It's because yeah. people people don't want to read cards, so that, that then they people, forget. Yeah, people make mistakes, and it happens at the highest level. Honestly, like. If you're not used to playing against a card, I mean, even on the highest level, think about how often Teferi was played or, like, Narset or Ashiok. Like, those cards were played a lot. And you still forget. No matter how many times you fuck yourself, you, like, you still forget that, like, oh, I can't cycle this and draw a card right now. Like, it's so, it's, I, th I swear, it's something about static abilities that it make is. it so hard. Like, that's why when War of the Spark not... came out, it was so difficult to do limited because there was, like... You just had so many planeswalkers that hit the board, and you're like, "Oh wait, I was supposed to draw a card because I played a creature with four attack or greater." Right. <laughs> right. Right. Just missing triggers left and right. Yep. Um, the the most my favorite like 
my favorite misplay because due to a static ability was I don't remember what set was out, but I know Amonkhet was in standard because the guy played Hazaret. Oh yeah. It was in the it was in the Pro Tour finals, I believe. He played Hazaret, and he had he had he had the win. All he had to do was like cast like Shock and then attack with Hazaret, because um, it would have put him down to one card in hand. But he got excited, and went to swing with Hazaret right away. And they're like, "You can't attack." And because you just tried to attack, that means you went to your combat step. Right. And so you can't do anything. He can't attack. So then he had to go to second main phase. He, like, played a shock or whatever, past turn, and then his opponent won on the crack back. And I was just like, that's so heartbreaking because of the the, the static ability of, like, can't attack unless you control. I was just like, oh. And that, you know, obviously when you're on camera and you're about to win, like, a fucking major tournament, you're like, that happens you know people dude are doing, i would um, fucking do that if i was about to win my first fucking pro tour and i top deck what i needed i'd be like oh slam and attack and then like i'd i probably break down crying right there i'd be like oh absolutely and, like, i just lost that like i i would like snap keep a one lander just because i'm like oh, i'm playing fast you know i know what i'm doing and I'm like, oh fuck, dude. Those, <laughs> no those those are my favorite hands to keep where like like the previous like three games you get flooded out so you you draw you draw a hand it's like one land and like two one drops but then the rest are like four or five drops you're like i can do it you're like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna flood this time around and or i've been flooding every other game so i might as well just keep this one and then you're like oh no yeah that goes back to like knowing the numbers right and trusting the numbers and knowing that like dude that's so fucking hard to do sometimes yeah no dude i do it all the time i mean (laughs) constantly i'm like oh this is two lander like this is definitely fine meanwhile my deck's like a ramp deck and i'm like no this is gonna be fine like i have so much ramp in this deck and i look i have like an exploring hand and that's just like okay dude this is why this is why kevin love feels the dead he could keep a seven land hand and be like this is good i got i'm not even kidding i would keep six landers pretty consistently i would keep Six lands and an explore, especially before mm. like Thoughtseize got printed into mm. the format. Like, granted, Field of the Dead wasn't as good back then because it didn't have our promise, but I would keep six land hands all the time <laughs> with the explorer growth spiral, and, and I would win a lot of time. And that's like, I think, another reason why that card was okay being dead. Yeah. Like, I, I don't, I, I, it's hard for me to think of a six line hand like that I would keep unless maybe I was up a game or something. But even then Dude, like, one thing that like is so hard about mulligans now is before it was just like you draw seven, you're like, no lands. Alright, I'll mull it. You throw it away. You draw your hand, you draw six cards, you're like two lands and like four cards, you're like, okay, I'll keep this. Scry, I'll top this land. Mm. Now it's like you you mull, you draw seven, you're like, this is a good hand. What do I put back? Yeah. Oh. Right. Oh. Oh shit. Yeah, like it, it actually requires skill now because if you put away the wrong card, you fucked up and you may pay for it now. I yeah. I've done and that like, before where I'm just like, and I, I don't need this card, and then I bite the yeah. bullet. I like it better. I think that they finally found um, a good way to do it. Yeah, I, I, that, I agree. Uh, seeing your seeing your seven is big, mm-hmm. and then putting one back totally fine. Like, I'd rather do that. Um, but neither of you guys, I don't think, played, like, when Mulligan was literally just draw six, draw five, draw four. Not getting to see another card, period. Um, and that was something that took a long time for them to change. And not to go into this, like, crazy, uh, I'm super happy they changed it. And I think that, like, because, like, before, it, so it takes a little variance out of, like, getting just getting fucked with, like, bad hands. Mm-hmm. Before it'd be like, you'd go down to five. Like going down to five was like way more common then. Like and even like four sometimes because like if you saw one land both times, like what the fuck are you gonna do? Yeah. Like if you draw now, if you see that extra card and it's a land, you're just putting some other high drop back into the bottom of your deck, and you're like, okay, well, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas before, like people would just like you just lose the mythic championship. Not that there was that back then either, but like you just lose the pro tour because you mulled to five or four in game two and yeah. like you just didn't play magic 
And, yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that the mulligan rule, like, is one of those other things, like a rule that like wasn't always around that people don't, you know, necessarily mm -hmm. even think about. Yeah, I agree that obviously it's a totally separate topic that we don't need to go into, but I, I agree that the London mulligan definitely feels like the mulligan, right. you know, the mulligan rule has changed a bunch since I've started playing at least. Mm -hmm. It definitely feels like the mulligan rule that feels the least bad, right? Mm -hmm. It feels, you know, mulling to six is just like, okay, like I obviously I'd rather keep a seven lander, but it's or seven card hand <laughs> not a seven lander um but like oh, six, six is fine and it's like five it's like oh this is bad but like i don't insta lose necessarily obviously yeah. every time you mulligan it's you're statistically more likely to lose but it's definitely not like nearly as bad as like what you're describing just going to six going to five mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah um It, like the London, the London Mulligan, I think is overall good, um, for the for for the uh not the format for Magic in general, um, and I think the only downside it brings is that it makes games feel a lot more of the same. Like I feel like they kind of play out in the same pattern, uh, right. a lot more than they used to. But I, I think that's like that's a sacrifice I'm okay with for consistency. Yeah. Because, like, yeah. I don't want to play Magic and just be like, oh, it's the Grand Finals, and I just had to mull to four each game. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's... Yeah. And I've seen it happen, and it's like, it so feels bad. Like, mm -hmm. I've literally, like, watched stuff like that happen, and where it didn't necessarily, like, <clears throat> decide who won, but, like, it's you're real just sitting bad. there, and, like, you're watching this pro player not play Magic basically yeah especially in a format with like thoughtsies or something because like kevin was saying like oh i could keep a six lander and, a, and a explore so if my opponent kept five cards and it's like three lands a dork and like a five drop or a six drop turn one thoughtsies literally good game yeah and, and you're then, just like uh, unless he fucking rips like a champ which is like statistically not in his favor uh you know it's just over and then like imagine like someone's like someone tunes into twitch like oh it's the grand finals let me watch what's happening it's like game five they come in the middle of the game like man this guy's getting smashed he must be Howdy. bad like he's gotta mm -hmm. be a bad player or a bad deck builder and you're like no he had a mold of three like the, yeah. the fact that this game is even like somewhat yeah. close is remarkable <laughs> but like right. you look at that you're like oh this is not fun like if mm -hmm. i tune in to like the grand finals of anything i want it to be like oh it's close like these this is you know a battle of giants but instead right Sometimes like unlucky shit happens. You're just like, yeah. I, I don't get to play. That's that's why they call spiking a tournament. Like it's because right. you have to get somewhat lucky because you, you hit. You have to. Like you can yeah. be a, you can be a consistent player and be like, oh, here I am making top like thirty two whatever, and then all of a sudden like, oh, spike, I, I got first, mm -hmm. and then back to thirty two because it's like, right. that's just the luck of the game sometimes. And I think yeah. trying to eliminate that variance of luck is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, like, you don't want to take it out completely, obviously, because that's what card games are about. But, like, that factor made it unfun a lot of times or unfair to an extent, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not, like, crazy. Like, no one's going to complain about it. It benefits everyone. Um, but it does, and it does even allow, to an extent, like, small percentages I'm talking here, like, different decks to compete in different metas more. Because, like, you love that mulligan rule if you're a combo player, right? Like... I get to see more pieces of my combo, yeah. even if I'm going to five. And sometimes that's all you need in a combo deck. Yeah. Um, I remember so that was like, a big argument against it when right. it first mm -hmm. came out. Because people were like, Tron is going to be insane. Right. Yeah. yeah. But yep. like, then on the same token, like, okay, we're going, I'm going to game two against Tron. And, like, I get to see seven cards every time Mulligan. I'm literally just looking for Blood Moon, you know? Like, yep. I'll go to five, but I'm still seeing seven. If one of those is a blood moon, I'm keeping it. Yeah. So like, you know, you have that side of the argument as well. Though. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, you have to keep it in mind. It's like it's a mirrored effect type of thing. I mean, unless like, mm -hmm. 
unless it's like oh the deck can win on turn one if it just has like this two or three card combo and they can yeah. consistently just do it then it's like oh yeah then maybe that's an issue like i think the london mulligan is probably a lot worse for like vintage and legacy because i mean cards are op as shit in that format so like yeah, you have to like vintage and stuff like you have to have what you can't even like pack negation because like i feel like because your upkeep you just lose so i don't i don't fucking know what you have i guess like force of will. oh for yeah duh that's what it is mm-hmm. you, you, you yeah. need like force of will you need like mental misstep you need some yeah exactly, exactly. all that like all, just that's random it. ass shit mm-hmm. so yeah Jeez. even though even on turn one you can't even do that so it's like mm-hmm. uh, but yeah so yeah I, those those formats obviously a little different there's a reason those aren't like these competitive formats um well legacy was it's it's unfortunately it's like dying off like they're they're not covering it anymore oh they're dying it's dying dude it is dying faster than most of the people that are dying from covid like seriously it is dude that 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 fucking format thrived on paper magic because that's yeah like i mean you could play it online sure but like what events are supported on yeah. like big events that are covered support on moto there's, there's not really anything i think mm-hmm. maybe there is stuff but I, I don't know about it and you know it's not it's not peaking numbers on twitch it's not like oh shit there's a legacy tournament this weekend Twenty thousand yeah. viewers like yeah i mean it's definitely like there's definitely like the legacy and vintage challenges mm-hmm. on moto but i don't think it gets covered like from like a commentator perspective i think it's just like oh reed duke is playing the vintage challenge this weekend like I'll watch redo because he's you know he's fun to watch, but like mm-hmm. it's not like it's being covered, and there's not like there's like there's no support for it really right now. Yeah. And there was at a time, and even before COVID, like it's been dying because they they take it off this tour and they take it off this tour, and it's not supported on yeah like they know, took MPGO it off or anything like that. And then like and it's a it's a I personally like to watch those games. I love seeing the powerful cards. I love seeing these powerful decks and I love seeing these like masters play these decks because it's a format that I've never really been able to play, mostly because cards cost fucking thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. Um like to make the mana base for any legacy deck is like five grand. Yeah. Not, so, not unless yeah. you make a monocolored deck, Sean, which you even love still, playing. Even still. <laughs> But yeah, that's like, the thing. Um, is like, I I love besides like modern's probably my favorite format, mm-hmm. and then other than that, it's probably like legacy. Like legacy, like vintage is too busted. Vintage is like mm-hmm. there's no far, rules. It's going to step, <laughs> going to step too far, but mm-hmm. um, <laughs> but like legacy, I feel like is such a it's such a good. You know, obviously everything's super powerful, but it's like it's in a spot where like there's still you know you know, you still get these like like Delver decks that are like really, really powerful, but then you have like Storm decks that are really powerful and then like Infect is even more viable in Legacy because you have like access to like Invigorate and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And like so like from like an actual like like gameplay perspective and like diversity of, of like what people play because like it's somehow balanced right it's, it's somehow balanced but like the thing is like in paper especially and this is why like scg stopped covering it and everything right it's like like to sean's point and this is a, another separate topic that i could talk about for oh, me too. days yeah. is like the reserve list just killed the format yeah as time goes on and as the reserve list lives on and i understand why it's still in place and i understand why some people don't want to get rid of it right but for people like you and me and pogogo and like new players who want to play like magic at its like best peak like all the Mm -hmm. spikes who just want to play the most busted shit right Mm -hmm. That's I would love to play Legacy, but the thing yeah. is, like, you can't. Like, I'm not gonna play. I'm not gonna play Moto just because I don't like. I just don't like it, and like I understand that that's like the most, ch- like the cheapest way to play Eternal Formats. Like I get it, right? But like, 
I would love to play Legacy in paper. Like, I would love to, like, obviously, like, not COVID times, but I would love to go to, like, Montesi or Kings for us, Sean, and, like, mm-hmm. play a Legacy. Like, play a Legacy tournament. Absolutely. Like, it's like, hey, do I want to play a Legacy tournament or do I want to buy an engagement ring or something? Right. Like, yeah. it's like, Wait, Kevin. No. Are you buying an engagement? I'm just giving it, I'm just giving an example, right? Just I, to like, on, I'm Sha- texting her. I'm texting Sean, her he right slipped now. up, didn't right. he? Right. Like he's here, here, here's, here's a better example. Would I rather play a vintage tournament or would I rather buy a Honda Civic? Like You're <laughs> buying live a Honda Civic? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, like, yeah. It's just like absurd because like and it's so stupid, right? Because like obviously like functionally dual lands are like the best version of a land that you can get and it's like yeah it's great and like you have to play it but it's not like it's you know decks are unplayable without them they're just more consistent and like legacy is such like a powerful format that you need the consistency so it's like like we said you're either playing a monocolor deck or you're spending like thousands and thousands of dollars mm-hmm. and even if you're playing a monocolor deck the only monocolor decks i can think of that are like good or either like mono red which is like whatever resident sleeper and or you're playing like elves combo which you still need guy's cradle for so right. it's, it's, I, well, like, I, I can just play a forest instead right yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. let me play it <laughs> yeah, right. and like i mean i have seen some shops some like lgs's run legacy nights where they're like hey you can proxy a whole legacy deck i still don't see people go to that event like maybe they'll go like once or twice but i never like see people go to it i don't know yeah. like i i mean part of me feels like i hate proxy stuff. well one you hate proxy and shit and two like the format is so skill demanding like if you look at the yeah. like, skill demanded yes. in um well okay the skill demanded in like legacy versus standard, you still need a good amount of skill. However, in standard, the first few turns don't matter that much. Right. I mean, they do, but not really. Legacy yeah. is like you play a land, and then you'll you see your lose. opponent. You'll see your opponent just sit there for like a good few minutes, and you're like, "Yeah, <laughs> the fuck are they doing?" You're like, "What's <laughs> happening like, here?" Like and, and they're like, "Sorry, like, like, like sorry, I'm kind of cool. land pass land." And then they're sitting there, and there's like brainstorm. <laughs> it's like mm. you sit there for five minutes because like nobody, yeah. nobody's ever played a brainstorm and had it be like the perfect thing. So it's like, oh, do I want to, do I want to brainstorm right. and permanent? Do I want to, do I want to fetch brainstorm on on my upkeep? Yeah. Do I have another fetch to to get rid of my cards if I don't want them with brainstorm? Like, <laughs> right. And then it's, like, and then it's like, also like if you both played fetches, and you're gonna go like. Fetch brainstorm and turn. It's like, does my opponent have a stifle? Am I gonna get fucking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's so many like, things. Do I, like... do, I, do I get a volcanic island? I don't need it right now. Do I just get a basic island in case he has blood moon or in case he has a wasteland? And it's just like, right. by the way, one mana. <laughs> yeah, like, is this turn one decision making? Yeah, like imagine like a new player like... trying to play legacy and they're just sitting there like, you know, it's your turn. You're like, sorry, I'm I'm trying to see if I have game. You're like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Well, but like, good. No, I'm just saying it's a, it's just uh, as you're saying the the skill intensity and like not knowing the matchups that great in standard is like okay like I know what these cards do I can read them and like understand what's gonna happen like okay there's general archetypes but in legacy it's like if you didn't counter or fight over the specific spell. If you just don't know that that like happens to be like the most important part of their deck, like, okay, you, you just lost. Imagine, imagine playing like in Legacy, and you just have no fucking idea what's going on. <laughs> so and the person, like, and the person plays Show and Tell, and you're like, oh, I get to play some of this. <laughs> Great, it's a symmetrical effect, and they're just like, <laughs> omniscience, and you're like, what? Omniscience, <laughs> yeah. uh, dude. My, my best story of like. My, uh, me surprised my opponent by being like I'm counting it if I have lethal this is yeah. my first time I ever top aided like a, um, a PPTQ when they were still mm-hmm. around which stood for preliminary pro tour qualifier yeah, um, I, 
top eight or one of those in my day as well. well I'm, I'm saying it for Kevin and the, the other people who may not know. <laughs> um, so it was back when, like, Guilds of Ravnica was out, or, like, Ravnica Allegiance, one of the two. And I was running um, Boros Aggro, and... Um, I was I was playing one spicy card in the main board called Chance for Glory, which mm-hmm. is a three mana instant, and it says, "Give your creatures indestructible this turn. Take an extra turn after this turn. At the end of the next turn, you lose the game." Lose the game. Yeah. <laughs> so I was running that in my Boros Egger deck. So I was like, "I could steal games with this. Like yeah, I could definitely absolutely. steal games with this." Two so like, combat steps? like yeah. So like, um, I was playing against like, uh, Golgari Explorer, I believe, and so. It was like turn three or four. All I know is I had a lot of creatures on board, and I had Chance for Glory in hand and Heroic Reinforcements in hand. And I was like sitting there for a good five minutes. My opponent's like, it, you know, you got you to hurry up, buddy. Like, it's your turn. And I'm like, sorry, I, I'm, I'm counting to see if I have lethal. And he's like, <laughs> it's not what? even possible. <laughs> yeah, Wait, yeah, what, it, is, what is Heroic Reinforcements? Oh, Heroic Reinforcements is a four mana sorcery spell. You create two one one soldiers. Give all your creatures plus one plus one in haze. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I was like sitting there. I'm like doing it, and that's when when I said like I'm looking for lethal. He's like, what could he have? Yeah, he, like he, he he couldn't figure it out because he's like, there's no possible what like <laughs> what there's no possible way. So he thought like I'm sure he's probably thinking like he's bluffing. Like there's no way. Mm-hmm. And then like I attack. He's like no blocks and like chance for glory he's like oh no (laughs) he's like yeah because he's tapped out so then i I, i'm like okay hit you for like six or eight or whatever it was i'm like on tap heroic reinforcements and he's like block block that's game Mm. that was game one go to game two (laughs) i top deck my chance for glory and it's turn like four and i'm like <laughs> One, two, oh, five, seven, and, he, and he's like, "Did you try it again?" And I'm like, "Maybe." Nope. <laughs> and I'm like, "Swing." I, I go swing, and he's like, "Block, block," and I'm like, "Chance for glory." He's like, "Okay," <laughs> and then, and I go next turn heroic reinforcements again, and I win. And he's like, "Damn, that! I mean, y- you had it, I guess. Like, cool." And I'm like. He's, yep. So he's talking to me about my list after the game, and I was just like, yeah, I run this, 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 and one chance for glory. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. I lost How to many? a one of twice, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. 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 Uh, was... Feels, feels bad. Yeah, it was, uh, he was, he was not thrilled. And that was like, my first time I top eighted a, a PPTQ, um, and then I got in trouble in the top eight on accident. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> Dude, it was my first time. I, I like. I I was just so innocent. That's all it was. But like, I was playing an opponent, and like, uh, I won game one. No, no, no. I, I I won game one, and like, as we were finishing up game one, like I had to pee really bad. So I was just like, at the, like I was holy next. I was just like, let's just finish this game. Just finish the game. So then, I finish the game, and then I say to my opponent, hey. Um, I'm going to the bathroom really quick. I'll be right back. And he says, okay. So I go to the bathroom and I had my phone in my pocket and my headphones like leading up. So he knew I had my phone with me and literally the bathroom was like, like that wall right there. Like that's where the bathroom was. So he sees me go in and I, I'm going to the bathroom and as I'm, as I'm standing there, I'm like, oh damn, I shouldn't have brought my phone in here. It, that kind of looks suspicious, but I'm like, I'm not doing anything. I'm not going to be out in just a second. So whatever. So then, I fucking exit the bathroom. The judge is standing at my at my table, <laughs> and he's like, "I need to talk to you." And I'm like, "Oh, okay, sure." Like mm-hmm. in my head, I'm like, "I'm pretty sure I know what the fuck I did." And he's like, yeah, he, yeah. "He's like, you need to tell me when you're going to the bathroom because I don't know if you're cheating or not." But and like he started going off on me. I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, sure, dude. Like my fault. I should have said yeah. something. Like right. my bad." And so he gave me, like, a warning. We played the next two games, and I lost. Whatever. And then I got a ride home from my friend. And my friend told me that that dude, like, because he was, like, in the room watching. As soon as I walked in the ba- bathroom and closed the door, he went, judge. And I was yeah, like, I was like, what? What of a course, fucking yeah. prick. 
Like, why mm-hmm. would... One, like, I get, like, you want to rule shark me. Whatever. People fucking do that. I don't approve of it, but whatever. Yeah. But, oh, like... People do it. Yeah. But, like, what does he think is going to happen that I'm going to get, like, disqualified? Like, it's a fucking mm-hmm. PPTQ. No, he's this probably, is he's, not a pro no, tour. Honestly, no, honestly, like, that. there are times where that might warrant, like, a game loss. So yeah. he's hoping, like, you won game one, um, then he wins game two, right? So now yeah. it's a one game two. I mean, he doesn't it, have to win two. I, I get that. But in my mind, I'm like, if my opponent's grabbing information, potentially, I'd rather him just not have that at all. I'd rather just right. be like, nope, stop it right now. I wouldn't want right. to be like, oh, I got game, I got game two, well, and then he gets yeah, to like, go first again. It's like, no, what? No, just fucking, just don't just let him do out. that. Just don't let well, him fucking do that. Yeah, or you just say like, can you ask a judge, or can you leave your phone? Yeah, you know? I, That's I, all he had to do. Yeah, I, I just, I fucking hate people like that. Like, I mean, I had, so Zach tells me all the time like. We had a huge argument about because I'm like kind of on your side with like the rule sharking, mm-hmm. but like one of the things he like was complaining about, and a lot of people were complaining about this, is they they made a rule change where like if you path to exile your opponent's creature, you have to tell them that they have a trigger, to search for a land. So before, it was just a missed trigger and that's it. But now oh like yeah, yeah, yeah. Now yep. if you miss triggers, like you can you can get in a lot of trouble for it. Like or if you don't tell your opponent about a trigger. Like, you can get in trouble for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. like, so what? It, what so it, he was go he was complaining because he was like, well, like, I would do that all the time where I would like path my opponent's thing, and if they didn't remember to get the land, then great, I just pass something for free. And I was like, dude, like, you know, and, and he's like, the, it wasn't even that. Like, it was the fact that he was complaining that he could now get in trouble for. It. I was like, you should get in trouble for that. Like. I, like, I get it. Like, your opponent missed a trigger. But, like, mm-hmm. with something like that, like, I yeah, it, the, just, it just bothers me somewhere on the inside where I'm just like, I, I don't really like hoping that you're, like, in order to win a game, I need my opponent to make, to, like, miss this trigger. Yeah. I don't want to like, win like that. Why, and that's why, like, people, like, will play out games even if it looks like they're going to lose because your opponent could just shit the bed and not mm-hmm. see it. Yeah. But, like, not seeing lethal is different than, like, you hoping that they miss, like, this this like pretty obvious trigger let's mm-hmm. say um, yeah so the the ruling that the, what the ruling was was like um both players need to maintain the board state so basically yeah. both players need to keep track of life both players need to be responsible for triggers so if you right. uh if you know that there's a trigger of something and you didn't say anything about it and then later on it comes up and you're like oh yeah you missed this then mm-hmm. you're both at fault you both get a warning which mm-hmm. <laughs> It's that's it's, hard, it's, it's a great you just area. Claim you forgot or didn't see it. Yeah, or, there, or it's a great area where it's like, oh my god, we both forgot. Like we're like you're both innocent about it. Like you just mm-hmm. didn't remember. You right. bring a judge up, and then he's like, you both have warnings. Like, oh, like I wish I just didn't bring it up in the first bring place. Now, right. um, but I yeah, I there... think it's overall healthy for the game. Like we don't no I, I want agree. people to get rule shark. Like it's just I, yeah I want to win because. I played better than my opponent. Yeah, and that's one uh, reason why yeah. I love. That's one reason why I love arena. There's no fucking rule sharking. If right. <laughs> if you if you fuck up, you fucked up. Like if you forgot to like at, like click the little button to like end step, use your like wilderness Stop. reclamation, yeah, then that's yeah. your fault. The, no one else's fault. But like, or if you misclick, or if you click too fast, or whatever. Or like yeah. you, so they settle the wreck at you, and like, oh, I'm being forced to search for land. It's like okay, sure. Right. There's no right. rule sharking in that. It's just like yeah. You just so going back to like judges being called just a quick story there's one like it's a feels bad man when like you get a judge called and like you're at fault or not a judge called but like so example for me i was playing in this tournament it's more like i don't know like lgs tournament you know like mm-hmm. i don't know probably like wait was it like an f and m the one i'm talking about now yeah no it was like uh i don't even know exactly what it was to be honest with you it was like out of town like I, we were traveling at the time to play a little bit uh-huh. it was like probably like it was like 100 people at an lgs or whatever uh-huh. so it wasn't like an fnm it was like i don't even know so it, it might have been some sort of qualifier because back then it was different even than like the pptqs okay okay um, but i'm there playing a game playing with like fucking 
a Haven Gold Witch deck with like Heartless Summoning. Like it had a combo with like Perilous Mirror and stuff. But um, I'm playing that deck. I, at the time, I was running Worm Coil Engine, which was in Standard, which was fucking awesome to play in Standard. Um, in yeah. my main deck, I ran two. So I'm like sleeping up my deck, like in the car on the way there. You know, my friend's driving. Uh, I think Zach was there with me, maybe. And then my friend Greg's driving. Sleeping up the deck, checking everything, you know, because, you, you know, obviously, if you go, you would know you have to like submit your deck list when you get there, mm -hmm. you write it down and everything like that. Yep. So I, I'm, I'm counting through my deck and I'm like, I have 59 cards. So I'm looking, 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 what am I missing? What am I missing? I'm like, oh shit, I'm only, I only have one worm coil engine. I run two. So I was like, cool. I was like, yo, does anyone have a worm coil engine? My friend's like, yeah, check my binder, you know? Cool. Get my worm coil, slip it in. Playing, I'm like 2 0, oh, going into round three and playing my opponent. Um, I win game one. It's against like Azo uh, Aristocrats at the time. It was like an, um, an Orzov deck. Um, kind of aggressive uh, type of deck. And I'm like, sweet. Like, my board's great against them game two, this and that. In the middle of the games, we get deck checked. So I'm like, okay, here you go. You know, no one called the judge. My opponent's great. You know, super nice guy. I'd seen him around, you know, and like at other gaming stores and stuff. Judge comes back, puts our two decks, deck boxes down, and he goes to me. He's like, I have your deck list here. He's like, uh, you, you know, you submitted two worm coil engines. He's like, you're running three. And I was like, no. I was like, I must have missed it. You know what I mean? Going through yeah. the deck or whatever. Yeah. And I was just like, fuck. And he's like, so that's, that's a game loss. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that sucks. And then my opponent won game three. So now I'm two and one. And I'm like, fuck, dude. Like, that sucks. So, and it feels bad because now my opponent's probably thinking, well, you know, Worm Coil is not exactly like a land. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's like a powerful card that you were like trying to hide or something. Yeah. And I just apologized. And I was like, dude, I'm so sorry. Like, I told him the story. And he was just like, no, nah, dude, it happens. I get it. Um, I, I I just felt so bad, like I did something so horrible. Yeah, it makes you look scummy when you're. Yeah, it's just an yeah. honest mistake. Like I have a similar story. This this happened. Um, yeah, last year obviously because there was no magic events this year. Um, mm -hmm. it was last year at a GP. I was playing Tashar combo and um. Shocker. <laughs> I was playing it at a, at a GP, and. I think like what happened is I wrote down I was running like four of a card in the sideboard, but I was actually only running three of. So like I just like miswrote down the the copies, mm -hmm. and so we get deck checked like before the round starts, and I was like okay whatever. And so I wasn't worried because I was like I double checked that shit. I'm good. He comes back and he's like, uh, can, can you come here? I need to talk to you. I'm like, oh fuck, what did I do? Like what happened? And he's just like, right here uh, you said you're running four, but there's only three right here and i count your sideboard you have 15 cards in sideboard 60 in the main deck i think there's just a typo but i have to give you a game loss and i'm like yep that's that's how this works i'm like yep, yep. it's perfectly fine it's... and then i proceeded to owe my opponent and i was like right. all right well it, it worked out but i was just like oh like it was it is the worst feeling ever yeah fucking it's really, awful it, it feels so bad yeah but anyway we got off topic there a little bit between the legacy and that, and you know. Mm -hmm. Kevin, do you ever have any anything like that happen to you? No, I'm not a cheater like you guys. So <laughs> <laughs> you're just a degenerate. That's all you are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Love Wait, it. have you have you played in like a like a like a competitive REL tournament? No. <gasps> 2021. That's the year, baby. Well, that's 20... why he was excited to come to uh, Magic Fest <laughs> or whatever by you. Yeah, I know. <gasps> Pepe heads. Oh. Rest in pepperoni. Yeah, for those watching, Kevin and Sean were supposed to come to... So I live in Minnesota. They live in New York. They were supposed to come to Minnesota this... What was it? June? July? July. Yeah, this July. July. For, for, the, for, the for the Minneapolis GP. For the Minneapolis GP. And uh, COVID happened. I'm just like, they're, they're not coming. Yeah. <laughs> this, ain't, this ain't happening. Yeah. Uh, which sucks. That actually sucks, man. I'm yeah, really for real. That would have been so much fun. We would have had like you know, a little sleepover. We would have had our sleeping bag. Or, yeah, the one sleeping bag that we all sleep in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one big one. Stay yeah. up all night playing magic. Oh, God. Yeah. 2021, man. One day. One day. Yeah, we, we can figure something out. We'll get, we'll get out there. Yeah. Uh, Ho we'll... Hopefully, uh, things will be better. Hopefully. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Just pray for the best, and that's it. Yep. Uh, all right. Well, that's 
we're we're a little over our 90 minutes but uh that's mm-hmm. episode three thanks everyone for watching thank you guys for being here thanks, and we'll uh we'll catch you next week bye 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 bye